Okay, so let's get started. We have a lab due today. I'm assuming that for those of you who took the trouble to come, you actually got it done. But no, you haven't got it. Uh, but if you have any questions that I can answer still, please let me know before I start the lecture. Any, anything that was not clear, still have issues that I should discuss. Yes. So when comparing the performance of the operation part and we know that. Uh, so, 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 uh
events or things that are happening in your distributed application, then those cannot be compared because you don't actually know whether the clocks were synchronized or not. Okay? So, so we need clock synchronization as a basic building block if we are going to use time style for any aspect of the application okay, that, that we have. Okay, so the question is, how are we going to do clock synchronization? So that's what I'm going to discuss today. Okay, And maybe towards the end of the class, I will talk about how you can do all of this without actually using clock synchronization mechanisms, which is basically going to be this topic of uh, logical clocks yeah, in, within clock synchronization. But let's get started. So very quickly, physical clocks, okay, you know what a clock is. Okay, so essentially you can uh, use different types of clocks to tell time. Uh, old days you use the sun. Okay, so essentially 24 hours are based on the rotation of the earth, one rotation. Um, okay, and uh, uh, the, the more accurate ones these days are what are called atomic clocks. So you essentially use properties of atoms to, to tell time. And that is what our most accurate clocks do today. Okay. So all clocks are essentially, all other clocks are essentially synchronized with some atomic clock somewhere in the world. Okay? And these clocks are so accurate that they uh, actually require you to occasionally add what are called leap seconds to real time because the rotation of the earth is actually slowing down over time. So 24 hours are getting a bit longer okay, over time. So because the clocks are more accurate than the rotation of the earth, you have to add these seconds just to keep make sure things are in sync and whatnot. Okay? So in any case, so that's atomic clock, but most clocks that we have access to, whether it's a watch that you wear, it's the one on your computer, they're not going to be that accurate. Okay? So they're act so they, most of them are crystal-based clocks. So essentially they look at the frequency of a crystal vibration to tell time. Every time a crystal vibrates a certain number of times, you take the clock by one second. That's the property of that crystal, okay? And it's stable. So, so you are going to use crystal clocks to tell time, okay? But most of these crystal clocks are going to have small inaccuracies, okay? Which is going to cause what is called clock drift. So your clock might actually run fast, little faster or little slower than real time, which is going to basically make the clock go off over a period of time, okay? So then what are we going to do? Every so often, you have to essentially resynchronize your clock with something that is going to authoritatively tell you what the time is. Okay? And that's the problem of clock synchronization. So we are going to have a coordinator that has the actual time and we need to synchronize with the coordinate. We meaning that computer needs to synchronize with that time uh, server or the coordinator to tell time. Okay? So that's our basic idea. So here is how your clock synchronization technique was going to work. Just one second. Uh, so we'll assume that given any clock, it has some drift rate rho. Okay? Drift rate is the maximum rate by which that clock would drift from real time. And that drift rate is going to depend on whatever type of clock you have. Every clock might have some max inaccuracy based on different versions of that clock and so on. Okay, so we'll call that drift rate rule. Okay, so what that means is uh, essentially, if you look at this figure, it's going to tell you uh, how the clock is going to work. So the x-axis here is real time. Okay, The y-axis is clock time. Okay, That means, uh, so this is how time is advancing. That's how the clock is advancing. Okay? So if the clock was perfect, every time, uh, every time the time advances by one second, the clock will also tick by one second. So it's going to be perfectly in sync. And that's essentially a, a, a line here with slope of one. Okay, So the clock, the DC, which is the clock, uh, how it advances, what is, so DT is going to be one, slope is going to be one. Okay? Now, if the clock is slower, that means that every time clock, the actual time advances by a second, the clock might advance a little less than a second. So over time, it's going to be slower than real time. Okay? This is the, the, that's how that clock is going to advance. So the slope is less than one. Okay? On the other hand, if the clock is ticking faster than real time, it's going to gain time. Okay? So then its slope is greater than one. Okay? So if you take any two clocks, okay, the maximum amount by which they're going to diverge is going to basically one is running at the rate of the slope of one plus rho. 
the other is going to be running at a rate of one minus rho because rho is the maximum clock drift. That means that's the amount by which this, this the slope is going to be different from slope of one. Right? So essentially you are going to be bounded between one minus rho and one plus rho. That's the maximum difference between any two clocks. Because the worst case is one clock is going at the fastest rate possible. The other one is going at the slowest rate possible. So they'll drift faster. Uh, that, that's the worst case drift that you're going to see. Okay, so now what this means is if you want to limit the time by which any two clocks are off by a certain value, okay, if you say, I don't want this, these two clocks to be off by more than one second, okay, that means that the maximum time that you can uh, uh, let allow before you resynchronize is going to be bounded. Okay? So essentially, because they're drifting uh, by uh, from each other at a rate of two row, okay, one is faster, one is slower. The maximum drift is two row. Essentially, if you want to limit the clock drift by a certain amount, then you have to essentially resynchronize at delta or two row. The delta is the maximum amount of time they can be off from one another. Okay, so that's saying that that's the period at which you need to resynchronize with some master so that they never go off from each other by more than a certain value. Okay, that's a very basic. Uh, principle of how clock synchronization is going to work. So we are going to assign some drift rate or some, that's the, the, the worst case drift of any clock. Okay, that's going to be depend on whatever chip you're using or whatever crystal you're used. And then you say, I want to keep the clock accurate by a certain amount. So that will tell you that's our, our de rho delta. Okay, or rather that's the term delta. So that will say every delta or two rho, you need to synchronize with some time server. Okay. And time server is assumed to be a server that's accurately synchronized with an atomic clock. Okay, so let me explain now a very simple algorithm to do this. Okay, so here uh, we have two machines. Okay, so there's a time server, okay, and we assume for now that the time server has the authoritative version of time. Okay. We can assume it's synchronized with some atomic clock and I'll explain how to do that. Okay. Now you have a machine that has its own clock. Okay. And we already said that that machine has to synchronize itself with the time server every delta over two row seconds. Okay. But that's the maximum every so often you're going to ask the time server for time and, and set your time to whatever the time servers. Okay. So what are you going to do? You just send a query to the time server saying what's the current time? Okay. The time server then sends you back whatever its clock tells it, okay, saying the time is X. Okay? And then you got to take that value that came over the network and change your clock time to X. Okay, so you're synchronizing with the time server. Is that clear? So you ask the time server for the time, it sends you back the time and you got to then assign that time to your clock. Okay? But there are some caveats. Your question is. Uh this is the request and response one very uh, latency. Yes, that's the point of what I was going to say. So I said there was a, ca a caveat. So the caveat is that these requests are going over a network. Okay, so there is going to be a latency between the time the time server sent you its message and by the time at which you received that message. So you got to account for that latency in order to set the time proper. Okay, so that's shown in this picture. Okay. So here the y x the downward axis is time. Okay. So this is the first line here is the machine. The second line here is the time server. Okay. At some time t, you say decide that it's time to resynchronize. So you send a request to the time server saying what is the time. Okay. And it's going to take a while to get there. So it got there a little later. Okay. And then so think of it as an RPC request. So then the time server process that request, and then what is it going to do? It's going to check the actual time on its clock it's time t and then send that in a message saying time is t okay? and it's going to take some time for that message to reach here okay? so clearly because there is a latency that has elapsed you can't just take t and assign the clock value to t that's going to be off it's going to be off by the network propagation delay okay so how are we going to correct for it okay? so what we do know okay, we don't know how much time the network actually or message takes on the network that is not known to us because you don't know how far the time server is from you. Okay? So we have to estimate that. Here's what we can do. You can say, when I sent the request, the time was T1, and I got the reply, the time is T2. 
Okay. So assume that the forward propagation latency and the reverse propagation latency are the same, which is not true in general. Okay. In fact, if you look at this figure, you will see that this latency is smaller than that latency. So they are not identical, but for right now, let's assume they are. Okay, so you know that the request left at time t1, a reply came back at time t2. So the time that has elapsed is t2 minus t1. Okay, that's for simplicity, just assume that we just divide that by two. Okay, so we'll assume that forward propagation latency and the reverse latency are the same. So if t2 minus t1 over two should give us an estimate of how much time it took for that request to come. Okay. So as the simplest correction factor is that some time came back from the time server. Okay, you estimate the, the total round trip time. Okay, you halve it. That's the latency it took for the message to come back. So you take the time that came from the time server, you add this adjustment, and that's what you're going to say. Okay, so you're going to take T request plus T reply over two as an estimate of T reply. So you are going to take T plus T reply and change your clock time to that time. Okay. Very simple technique, but of course, you will see that there are errors because you you made some assumptions. Right? You assume that round trip time is essentially going to say that what the forward propagation and the reverse propagation latency are identical. But it's a simple technique, it works well. Law, simple algorithms use this technique. Okay. It's called Christian's algorithm. Yes. Can you explain why top trip is happening? Why is clock drift happening? Okay, so, <laughs> the, so the, every, any clock that you have okay, is not going to be accurate. So if you have, let's say, if you have an old wristwatch, okay, a mechanical clock, you probably know that it's going to lose time or gain time over time. Why is that? Because it's using some crystal inside it to tell time. Okay, that crystal, and you use oscillation properties of crystal to tell time in this case. So let's say you have quartz crystal. It has a certain physical property that says it oscillates some number of times every second. So you count okay, every time it lets you oscillate 10,000 times, you pick it by one second. But because these are material properties, they are going to have slight differences from one material to the other. Okay, so your clock will drift over time because it's not going to pick exactly at the same time. Okay, And that is true even for computer clocks because they have a chip. But the chip also uses some property of a material to tell time. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Question is basically something is that even though we might have clock three, but the duration of T is by minus two bit to be accurate. Okay, so you asked the question. So first of all, clock drift has nothing to do with setting your clock using clock synchronous. Clock drift is a property of how bad your clock is or how accurate your clock is. Okay, now what you have to do is based on how off it is, you might have to synchronize with the time server either more frequently or less frequently. If your computer clock is really, really accurate, you, can, you might have to synchronize the clock server once a day because it doesn't drift a whole lot. So it's actually whatever time it's saying is, is a good value. Okay? But if you have a bad clock on your machine, it keeps drifting, then you have to synchronize more frequently. Okay? And that is essentially what is captured by this parameter rho. Rho is the maximum value by which your clock is going to drift. Okay? Delta is the accuracy you want for your clock. You, if you say, I don't, regardless of how much it drifts, I don't want my clock to be off by more than half a second, then your that delta is half a second and rho is the amount by which you drift. So you have to resynchronize the time server every delta or two rho second. Okay. So every every delta or two rho seconds, you are going to invoke this clock synchronization algorithm, which is going to perform this set of measurement. It's going to send a request, get a reply, and change the clock. Okay. So clock drift is not actually in the clock synchronization at all. That's just telling you how frequently you're going to do this. It's every so often you're going to essentially run this thing. So all that we did here is to estimate the round trip latency between the machine and the time server so that you can correct the value that came back from the time server by the, the propagation latency. Okay? Because you can't just take T and assign it because by the time you do that, the time is already advanced. 
at least advance by T reply. Okay, so you got to correct for that. Okay. Any other questions here? Okay, so this, yes, your question. Uh, why do we put the cost chain two before the row? So the, the row is like uh, how much the time trip in every time, right? So why do we put two? Okay, question is why do we put row uh, two? Because we assume that you want to limit your drift with respect to some other machine on your network. If that is going to drift by two row, you I mean rather uh, row, you might drift by negative row. You maximum drift between two machines on your network is two row. Okay, it's not just how much off your clock is. It's also how much off somebody else's clock is because you are going to make this machine be part of a distributed system. Right, so that is why we put two rows. So that's what it showed here. Right, so one is going. Faster one is going slower, so they're going to drift by a max of two rows relative to one another. So we assume the row of that two machines to the same. Question is, do you assume row of the two machines to be the same? In this case, we assume it to be the same. They don't have to be, but we assume that they are all using maybe the same type chip or something like that. Right? Any other questions? Okay. So here's a different technique. It's called Berkeley algorithm. Okay uses the same basic idea. All these clock synchronization techniques are going to use the same basic idea, but they differ in what assumptions they make. Okay, I should mention one more thing in the previous technique. Uh, we used T request plus T reply over two as an estimate of T reply. Okay? But you can also make multiple measurements. You can make this request multiple times and then there to take those measurements and take the average of those measurements as a better estimate. Because who knows when you send the request, maybe there was a burst of traffic over the network. It may give a skewed value of T request or something like that. Right? So making multiple measurements gives you more stable values for T reply. Yeah, so typically you will do that in a clock synchronization algorithm. Okay? Having said that, the Berkeley algorithm makes a different assumption. It assumes that there is no time server in the network. Okay? Christian's algorithm says there is a a coordinator that knows the actual time, all machines synchronize with that coordinator. Okay? And because all machines are synchronizing with the coordinator, those machines are implicitly synchronized with one another because you are synchronizing with an authority. And so hence the machines are also synced with one another. Okay? And you can ask, what if there is no time server in the system at all? Okay? You just want to do relative synchronization. We want to assume that these two machines are synchronized without using a time server. Yeah, because you just want to compare the clocks on these two machines, you may not care about what else is happening. So how do you do that? So then you assume now there's a group of N machines. They just want to synchronize with one another without a uh, clock, uh, without a time server. Okay? So how is that going to work? Okay. So what you will do, okay, this is a picture that shows you how Berkeley algorithm work. But what you are going to do is you are going to query all the machines in your distributed system or application for their time. Okay. So you ask not the time server, but you ask all other machines saying, what's the time? Okay. Then you take all the clock values okay, and you find the average time in the system. Okay. And you say, that's the time that we are all going to use as the uh, time on the clocks. Okay. So let me just repeat what I said. You ask all machines for the time. They all send you their time. They send you their local clock values. You take all of those values. You find the mean. Okay, That's the mean clock in the system. And then you send that re uh, response to everyone saying, this is the time we should set. And then everyone then synchronizes with that. Time. Okay. Now, you should understand that, that you just found a mean of some clocks that the assumption here is some clocks are faster, some clocks are slower. So if you take the mean, then most of the, the system clocks are going to take it on average with what real time might be. Okay? But there is no guarantee of that. So maybe all the clocks are running faster. Okay? So then you just take the average. That doesn't mean that you synchronize with anything in the real world. You just synchronize the clocks with one another. But those all, all of those clocks might drift with respect to real time. And that's okay because in this case, we are doing relative synchronization, not absolute synchronization. Okay. So having said all that, let's look at this example here. So we have three machines. 
Okay, then one at the top, the clock says three. Here it says 250, here it says 325. Okay, so this that clock says three. This is off by 10 minutes with respect to that 25 minutes faster. So that machine is essentially sent a query saying, What's the time? So then basically it sends its time and says, Send me the difference. Okay, so it sent uh, three. What's your clock? So this machine says, I'm 10 minutes slower, so it's a negative 10. This one says I'm 25 minutes faster, so it says 25. And then, of course, you are uh, sending zero to yourself. And you find the mean of these values, and you basically say that let's set the time to 3 or 5. That's the mean value of all of these clocks. Okay, so then you send a request uh, to this machine saying advance your clock by 15. You send a request here saying bring your clock back by 20. And then that clock goes by five. So then they are all synchronized at this point. The time is three. Okay? Now, as I said, that may have nothing to do with real time. Okay? Because the assumption here is with the, by taking the mean value, okay, you may do okay because some clocks will be faster, some will be slower. But that's not required in any system. Is that clear? Now, everything I said in the previous case is still true. When you send these messages, you still have to estimate the the round trip times and so on. Okay, that's not being shown here. Okay, so all of that is still to send a request, get a reply. You don't just take the value that came back, you adjust it by the network propagation latency. Okay, so that part is not shown here, but that is still part of the technique. It's just saying what do you do on top of that. Any questions? Yes. What? Does the drift rate uh, change over time? Does the drift rate change over time? It potentially could change over time. Okay, but you have to remember that rho is the maximum drift rate that the manufacturer of the clock has guaranteed, saying regardless of you, maybe they make thousands of chips or watches every year, but they say across all of the products we make, the worst case is rho. Okay, so it might drift, but it won't drift beyond rho. It will be between zero and row. Okay. Yes, question. Yes. So, question is how often the the time demon here or the machine at the top makes this uh, request? That depends on whatever we said previously. If you want the clocks to be within certain value delta, saying they should not be off by more than delta, you will run this technique every delta over two row. Okay. So that's still the same. The only difference here is there is no time server. Okay, is that clear? Any other questions? Okay. So that's the Berkeley algorithm. But there are many more. Okay, these are just two of the very simple ones. You know, all kinds of techniques. Uh, you can say, can we use decentralized algorithms? Yes, you can. In the decentralized case, takes us one example. Every machine can run its own version of Berkeley algorithm. It's just asking for everyone's time, and then it just sets its time to be the average, but it doesn't tell anyone else to do anything. Okay, As a, So everyone has to run the same technique. That's one, one example. Okay, Now, uh, as I said, you can make multiple measurements, but then you can also throw the outliers to ensure that your T request and T reply estimates are more stable. So they are not going to get skewed by some outlier because you take the mean, if there's an outlier, it's going to skew the mean. Right, so you can throw out the outlet, can do all kinds of things to make this more stable. Okay. Uh, there is a command on most Unix machines, it's called rdate. Okay, that's essentially, we just call rdate and give it a machine name, it's going to run the uh, Berkeley algorithm. It's going to essentially ask, for, not the Berkeley algorithm, Christian's algorithm, excuse me. It's going to essentially ask that machine, assuming that machine is the time server, get its clock, estimate the round trip time, and set your clock. Okay. That's a Unix command uh, to change your clock value. But most machines are going to use a more sophisticated protocol called NTP, Network Time Protocol. Okay. That's a standard protocol that every machine is designed to use. Okay. So you have to set a time server on your machine. Okay. And that's an NTP time server typically. And then your machine will just contact that time server and run Essentially, it runs a very sophisticated version of Christian's algorithm. Okay? And uh, that algorithm ensures okay, that typically your clock is within 1 to 50 milliseconds of an atomic clock. Okay? So inaccuracy in any at any point in time, 
your clock would not be off by more than that value. Up to 50 milliseconds is what it guarantees. Okay. Yes. Okay, question is, is the network latency is going to play a role, sir, when the clock for the machine 250 receives the, this message, it should send 10, uh, negative 10 points something. So keep in mind that the network latency is adjusted later. Okay, The time server always sends its time. It's the receiver at the receiver end is where you're going to do the adjustment. Okay. So that's what we did here. The time server sent T and then at the receiver, we estimated it and changed the clock value by T plus T reply. Okay. Same is going to be true in this case. The time daemon asks for times. Everyone just sends their time. They don't do any adjustment. Then it's the time daemon's job to estimate the latency for each machine and adjust the clock values it's received from them. And then you take the mean. Okay. So what you're saying does happen, but you shouldn't be done by whoever is sending the time is done at the receiver end, okay? Anything else? Okay, so NTP. So it's a widely used standard based on Christian's algorithms, uses eight pairs of measurements to find your T request and T reply. So mm -hmm. these are these values here, okay? Uh, it has notion of hierarchy. So you can have master time server, you can then have other time servers that coordinate with that, then you can have machines coordinating with those uh, and so on. But it allows you to ensure that the error don't propagate. Okay? Because if you have one authoritative time server and then you have another one that's synchronizing with that machine, that machine, the second time server will be off by some value. Okay? Because it will have its own clock that's going to drift. And then if you're synchronizing with something that's not an authority, then you will be drifting by more. Okay, so, so you don't want hierarchical synchronization to cause additive drift. Okay? And uh, NTP has ways to, uh, has uh, some uh, additional techniques it uses to correct for that, okay, which we won't go into. But the thing I do want to say, as far as NTP is concerned is, in NTP clocks will not ever go back. If you are running faster than real time, okay, let's say you're 10 minutes ahead of real time, you contact the time server, is you are faster than real time, you don't set your clock back. Okay? And the fundamental reason you don't want to set the clock back because time stamping will actually be important, right? So you time stamp something, okay, and then you synchronize the time server, your clock went back by 10 minutes. And then you time stamp something else. But in real order, whatever your timestamp later now has a previous timestamp. So if I look at the timestamp, they don't mean anything because you can't reason about them, right? So for that reason, you cannot actually let time on clocks go backwards, at least in a distributed system. If it's your clock, your wristwatch, fine, you can set it back, okay? No harm done. But in a computing system, if you do this and you're using timestamp to do any reasoning, things are not going to work, okay? So what do we do if you are running fast? If you are running slow, you can advance time. That's not a problem, right? If you're 10 minutes slow, you can jump. No harm done. If you're 10 minutes faster, you don't want to go back, okay? So how are you going to actually synchronize if you have a faster clock? Yes. You make it run slower. You make it run slower. So you essentially slow down your clock until real time has caught up with you. You can't go back, but you, so let's say you start taking every two seconds instead of every second. So time will advance at the same rate, but your clock is advancing slowly. So time will catch up with you. Then you basically uh, let the clock tick at this normal rate. Okay, so that's what you're going to do. You'll essentially slow down your clock. If you're running faster, you slow down your clock for a small period until real time catches up. Okay, that's what you're going to do in NTP. That will ensure that any timestamps or events, any file system modifications and all those actually mean something. And you are not going to set it back and cause an older timestamp on a newer event, which will then cause all kinds of other problems in your system. Okay. All right. 
So that's NTP. So if you have any machine, you should actually go and look at the uh, the time settings. Usually it will have some uh, NTP server. It's on Max, it is going to just, by default, it's set to time.apple.com. That's Apple's time server. But you can set it to any, any other time server or UMass as well. So you can set that to ntp.umass.edu, then your machine will start synchronizing with the UMass uh, time server, for example. Right? So there are many time servers, but you can use any one that uses NTP. Okay. Now, before I proceed, I just want to say a few words about where is this authoritative time server getting its time from? Right. So you can ask that question saying, I said there's a time server. That time server better have an accurate clock. Okay. Where is does that get its time from? So first of all, that time server's clock is actually not accurate. It's going to have the same problem as your clock. It's just that it's uh, frequently synchronized with an actual atomic clock, okay, which has the real time. Okay. So how are you going to do that? So there are many ways to synchronize with an atomic clock. Uh, typically, most countries have a standard atomic clock, and then they broadcast this value. Okay. It's essentially sent over shortwave radio. So you can actually have a radio receiver connected to your machine and that goal of that radio receiver is just listen for this broadcast. Right? So those broadcasts come in that tell you the time and then you're going to synchronize your clock with that time. Okay? So that's how you're going to do it. Now, modern days, lots of other things are synchronized. So the way your phone is going to synchronize is that cell towers are themselves synchronized with an atomic clock. So all cell towers also broadcast time. So your phone simply has to listen to the cell tower broadcast and set its clock. It does not have to listen to a atomic clock. It does not actually have to do NTP because the cell towers did took care of that for you. Okay. So many different ways. You have to buy a receiver. It doesn't cost much. You can get it to plug it into a USB and then you run some software and it's going to listen to these values that come over the air and then just synchronize your clock. Okay, that's how you can set up your own NTP time server if you so wish. Okay. Now keep in mind that uh, the, uh, the atomic clock is typically not very close to you. Okay. The one in the US is in Colorado. Okay, so that's where it's broadcasting from. So it's going to take some time for its broadcast to also reach your machine. Okay. And typically you have to correct for that as well. But in this case, these are speed of light propagation time, not network propagation time. So you can ignore them if you so wish, assuming that the time time it takes light uh, for light to travel from Colorado to Massachusetts may not be that much that you need to actually correct for it, right? So if you want to keep it within 50 milliseconds, it's not going to take 50 milliseconds for that light to propagate, They're less than that. So you are okay if you do not actually account for the time it took for atomic clock broadcast to reach your NTP server. But normally you would have to even correct for that if you wanted to get a really accurate measurement. Is that clear? Okay. So we can now talk about another way to do clock synchronization and that's using global positioning system or GPS. You all know what GPS does. You usually use it to actually get driving directions. Okay. Now it so turns out that in order for your phone or whatever device you are using to get driving directions, it actually has to solve a clock synchronization problem as part of figuring out the location. Okay, so we'll try to understand how GPS will actually do clock synchronization and it's going to do location. Okay, GPS is a location technology. Okay. It allows the GPS receiver to figure out its global coordinates with respect to some satellites in the sky. But to do that, you actually have to do clock synchronization. So any GPS receiver will automatically do clock synchronization as part of that process. So let's try to understand how and why. Okay. So I'm going to first explain this concept in two dimensions, and then we look at how do you do it in three dimensions, which is what you have to do on the surface of the earth, right? So it's a three dimensional problem. So let's take two dimensions. So, so how, are the, how does GPS work? Okay, so the way it's going to work is as part of the GPS system, okay, there are satellites in the sky, okay? And those satellites are at known locations, okay? You launch a satellite and it's now parked at a known location somewhere in the sky. It's essentially orbiting the earth, but it's at a known location. 
Okay. And we assume that the location of the, so it's in a geostationary orbit, which means it does not move with respect to the surface of the earth, as opposed to low flying satellites or airplanes that are actually moving. Okay. So this one is actually stationary with respect to, is rotating at the same rate at earth. So it's stationary with respect to the earth, okay. but it's parked at a known location. So you know the location of the satellite. Okay. This satellite, let's say, has an atomic clock and it's broadcasting that value. Okay. So now these are called beacons. Okay, so the side, all these GPS satellites are doing is they just broadcast time, saying this is the time. Okay? So your GPS receiver is now on the surface of the Earth. Let's say it's your phone. You want to find directions to go somewhere. Okay? So to do that, you have to figure out, the phone has to figure out two things. Okay? First is it has to figure out its location. Okay? Without knowing where the phone is, it can't tell you directions to where it, you want to go. Okay? So let's figure out what its location is. And then we'll see it also has to figure out how to do clock synchronization because otherwise it won't actually work, not be able to find its location. So I'm going to draw a picture to show you how all this works. Okay. So let's say that I'm just going to illustrate this with some examples. Okay. Let's say that's a satellite okay, in two dimensional. Okay, we know its coordinates x comma y. Okay, that's its known coordinate. Okay, it is just simply sending some broadcasts. Okay, so let's say it sent a broadcast at time t. Okay, and we assume that that broadcast was received by another receiver or GPS receiver at time t one. Okay. So you send the broadcast at time t, it received, it was received by your phone at time t1. Okay, so the time that has elapsed, okay, is t1 minus t. Okay, to send something at time t, it was received at time t1. So the time that has elapsed is t1 minus. So now you can ask what's the distance between your GPS receiver and this satellite? Okay, so you have to say what rate speed did this beacon travel? Okay, traveling at the speed of light. That is a wireless broadcast. Right? All travel at speed of light. Speed of light is known quantity. Okay, so we'll call that c. Okay, okay distance is c times t two minus t one. Okay, so that's the distance. So now we know the distance between the satellite and the receiver. Okay, so now we say if the Receiver is at an or not the receiver, the satellite is at a known location x comma y. Okay. And you know that the receiver is at a distance d from that satellite, and d in this case is t1 minus t times c. Where could this receiver be with respect to the satellite? So, what is something that's at a distance d from some point? So a circle. Right, all points on a circle are at equal distance. So all we know at this point is that your GPS receiver could be anywhere on a circle. Right, we still haven't figured out the actual coordinate. All we now know is this receiver, GPS receiver, is at a distance d from that satellite. Okay, yeah. but there can be infinite points on a circle, so we've not solved anything yet. Okay, but we'll assume that there is more than one satellite. There are many. Okay. So we'll repeat. So we'll find another satellite which is at some other location. Okay, we'll say that this satellite is at a look here location x1, y1. Okay, that's also sending broadcasts. All right. So it's going to send a broadcast at let's say time t2. It's really that's going to reach this receiver at some other time here. Okay, and this distance is let's say t2 minus t3 times c. Okay. So now that satellite, that receiver is now on some other circle with respect to the second satellite. Okay. So we'll draw another circle. It's not going to fit. I'm oh, sorry. Actually, let me just erase that. It's going to actually, I didn't draw a good figure, but it's basically going to look like that. Right. Now, Essentially, the receiver has to be on both of those circles at the same time. Okay. 
So it follows that it has to be the intersection of those two circles because only some points that are on both the circles will are precisely the intersection of those circles. Okay. So in the worst case, there can be at, so at most two points that you will intersect. In the best case, you'll have one if the circles are tangential to one another. So now we have narrowed down the location of this receiver to two points, some infinite points. Okay, because the receiver can either be here or it can be there. One of those, because those are the only two points that are on both the circles, and the receiver has to be on both of those circles as per our measurements. Okay, so now we are down to two points. We still don't know which of the two it is, but you can repeat. Okay, there could be a third satellite. You will repeat. Hopefully, the third circle is going to intersect at one of those two points, and maybe it will intersect, it and you solved your problem. Okay, that's how GPS is going to work. So, so it will basically listen for broadcasts from satellites which are at known location. It's going to estimate the time it took for those broadcasts to reach it. Yeah, because that broadcast come with a timestamp there. So you know when the when that broadcast left the satellite, you know when you received it because you know your time. Okay. You take the difference between those two times. So now you know the distance to each satellite. And then you use this technique. Okay. Yes. Are you assuming that T1 and T2 are actually being synchronized with some atomic clock? Okay, are we assuming questions? Are we assuming T1 and T2 are being synchronized with some atomic clock? We'll assume satellites are perfectly synchronized with an atomic clock. Okay. Satellites are like our time server. They are, they are, their time is perfect. Okay. So T1 and T2 are synchronized with respect to atomic clock. But the thing we have not yet talked about is what about the time on your phone or the GPS receiver? Okay. That time has to be synchronized with the satellite because otherwise that this measurements of T2 minus T3 times C is not going to be accurate because we assume that the, the packet left at time T, it arrived at time T1, that T1 is your local clock, not an atomic. T is an actually an atomic clock, well, that's accurate. Your clock may not be accurate. If your clock is not accurate, that distance measurement is going to be off. And if the distance measurement is off, your locationing x, y coordinates are also going to be off. So then you will not locate the GPS receiver won't know where it is on the surface of the earth. Okay? So you have to make sure that your clock on the GPS receiver is also synchronized with respect to the atomic clock. How are we going to do that? If we don't have any other protocol here to synchronize, we have to use GPS itself to synchronize. Okay. So we'll essentially now assume, yes, your question. I have a doubt. So you said that uh, mobile cell towers cannot broadcast uh, signals from the satellite. So that's the problem. Okay. So that's why the mobile phone is using the problem. Okay. Question is, I had earlier said that a phone can listen to cell tower broadcast and synchronize itself with respect to an atomic clock. So the time on the phone is probably accurate. So you don't need to synchronize. That's true, but not all GPS receivers are phones, right? So we are just doing GPS. So when you send this satellite, you didn't assume that all of the receivers are. Good. So assume a GPS receiver that is not a phone. How is it going to work, right? So we'll assume that the, there is an unknown clock drift delta on your GPS receiver. Okay. So as part of this process, we actually have three unknown, not two. So it's the unknown here were X comma Y, which was the unknown location of the receiver, but there are actually three, okay? There's X, Y, and Delta, which Delta is the time by which your clock is off with respect to the atomic clock. Just we want to actually solve for three unknowns, okay? And we use the same technique. It actually is going to work. I'll show you uh, the equations and then we can go back and look at how this works. So, so we'll assume here that uh, there is a time ti at which the a satellite i has sent its broadcast. Okay? There's time t now, that's the time at which the GPS receiver has received that value. And there's a time d, which is the drift unknown value. Okay? So essentially, T plus D is the actual time. T now plus D is the actual time. T now is what the clock tells you. There's a drift D. 
So if you sum them together, that's the actual time. Okay. So we, so essentially the actual delay is not t now minus ti, it's t now minus ti plus dr because you have to actually account for the real time there. Okay. So we will assume that's an unknown as well. Okay. So now we can go back and try to do the calculation again. Let me try to erase all this. All right, so now this time actually has another value D. Okay. So how are we going to solve for X comma Y? Okay, so, so we have, we're going to use some two formulas. Right? So, so this one is, that's X comma Y. Let's say this one is X one, Y one, that's an unknown. Okay. So the distance D, what's the Euclidean? So you just use the Euclidean formula, which is X minus one square plus Y minus Y one square. That's the distance between those two points, right? We also know that the distance is essentially going to be D is equal to C times T one minus T plus D, which is the drift. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. Those two have to be the same. So that's essentially going to give you one equation with three unknowns. Okay. X one is an unknown, Y one is an unknown and D is an unknown. Okay. It's not a linear equation. It's a non-linear equation, but it's still an equation. Okay. So you have one equation for one satellite. If you do this for three satellites, you will have three equations with three unknowns. Of course, it's a nonlinear equation. They will not have a unique solution, but you can solve these nonlinear equations with maybe more than three satellites and eventually you will get X1, Y1 and D. Okay. So once you have all three, then you can solve this problem well, because now that you figured out the X, Y coordinates of the GPS receiver, and you also figured out the clock drift so that all your distance estimate with respect to the satellites are now accurate. Okay, So you solve the clock synchronization problem as part of a locationing problem. Is this clear? Yes. Okay, questions. So the calculation happen at the receiver or the satellite, all calculations done by GPS receiver. Satellites are simply just broadcasting time. Every few milliseconds they're sending broadcast. Yeah. So the receiver is simply listening for broadcast, is doing this calculation, it's solving a set of equations and it's trying to find its location and the clock drift. Because if you have a clock drift, your estimates or distance are going to be better. Okay. Any questions on this? Yes. Question is, is the clock drift constant? We don't care about the actual drift rate. You are talking about the drift rate. Drift rate doesn't matter. Drift rate can keep changing over time. At this point, the clock has drifted by some value D. That's not the drift rate. That's the actual time is drifted by 25 milliseconds, right? So this D is a number, it's not a rate. That's the time by which the clock is off at the current time. So you will solve this problem. You'll reset the clock and you also get your coordinates. So the question is, is D is constant? D is not constant. D is the time by which your clock is off with respect to real time at this point in time. Okay? If you don't synchronize, the D might change over time. It might actually cause if the drift rate changes, it will drift by some more time. So how do you consider this problem as Question is, how do you assume that this is three unknowns because D is different. D is not different with respect to three satellites. D is what is happening. D is the time by which your clock is off now. Let's say it's 25 milliseconds. You are performing all these calculations at this point in time with respect to all the satellites. You don't do one satellite and one hour later do another satellite. Right? You're doing all of these calculations now so you can find the current position. Right, so D is the same for all the satellites because all the calculations are happening at the same time. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. 
So let's go back to GPS and now talk about how to do this in, yes, we have a question. Um, so if, uh, when you wrote it down, you said it like x one X and Y coordinates, what's the Z on this line? Yeah, that's what I'm coming to. <laughs> so, so that was how to do GPS in two dimensions, but the world is not 2D, it's 3D, right? So any coordinate on the surface of the earth are going to have the coordinates in three dimensions, X, Y, and Z. X, Y is the actual location on the surface of the earth. Y is your elevation, because you're going to not all have the same elevation with respect to sea level, right? So you have to now actually locate your phone in three dimensional space, not on a two dimensional space, okay? So now you have three, un actually four unknowns. There's X, Y, Z, which is the location of the GPS receiver with the rest of the surface of the earth and some coordinate system, okay? And then there is the unknown value D, that's the time by which this GPS's clock has drifted with respect to real time, okay? So four unknown, principle is exactly the same. Okay. Satellites are going to broadcast some value of time. You receive that at some point in time. Okay. And then you know the distance with respect to the satellite. Okay. But now you're in three dimensional space. So you are now on what, what is something that is of a, 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 the same distance from a point in three dimensional space. Okay. It has to be a sphere, right? So you are now with respect to each satellite, you are trying to find your location on a sphere because all points on that sphere are equidistant from the center of that sphere, which is where the satellite is. Okay? So if you have two satellites, you will have intersection of those two spheres. Okay? Intersection of two spheres is a circle. Okay? So with two satellites, you can narrow down the GPS location on a circle. Okay? Then you put another satellite, then you have two intersecting circles. Okay? So if you have two circles intersect, you're down to two points. Okay? If you have four satellites, you will have four intersecting spheres. Hopefully you'll get it down to one point because there are four unknown. Typically these are non-linear equations. With four satellites, you can't really get an accurate estimate. Okay? So you need more because when you're non-linear equations, you might actually have more, more than one solution. Just as quadratic equations don't have a single solution. Right? More than one, two in fact. Right? So in this case, you will need more than four satellites, but with maybe five or six satellites, you can get a good fix for your GPS receiver. Okay? So that is how all GPS receivers are going to work. Now there's a question of, can you do, do you need to do this drift thing because you can essentially assume phones are synchronized. You could do that, but the way all of this works is the GPS calculations are happening on a hardware chip, They're not in software. So the chip does not necessarily have access to your phone's clock. So it will do all of this calculation on the chip and output a value. Okay? So you don't really, you could take advantage of the fact that on a phone, you have a, already a clock that is synchronized, but you better make sure it's actually synchronized and software has to do that. So you avoid all that and you do it all, all on hardware. because so all the GPS things they run on a chip. You find a GPS chip, it'll do everything and output a value. Is that clear? All right. So that's how GPS is going to work and uh, essentially allow you to not only find the position of any GPS receiver on the surface of the earth, it will also solve clock synchronization as part of that problem. That's when you get that for me. Yes. Um, what you need to do is actually issue a priority to the so does that mean our device needs the capability to you know, communication to the satellite? Okay. Question is, when you do GPS, is the GPS receiver making queries to satellites? And does that mean that you have the need to communicate with satellite? That's what you're asking, right? So as I was saying, you are actually not going to communicate with the satellite. The satellites are simply sending broadcast. You just listen to broadcast. It's like a radio, right? There's a radio station. It's just sending a broadcast. Okay, all radios are simply listening to broadcast, and then you basically play whatever you heard. It's the same thing, right? So satellites just these GPS satellites are just broadcasting time. Okay, they have location and time. Right. 
location is known, but you, you might actually have to figure out which satellites send the broadcast. So there has to be satellite ID and time, and you just keep broadcasting. The GPS receivers are simply listening to satellite broadcast. So you do need the ability to receive a satellite broadcast, but not actually send anything to the satellite. Okay, yes. So uh, since you say that uh, in mobile phones, the towers are like in the global value for the time. So uh, in that case, why do we have to listen to the satellite? Like for in the cars, servers like GPS is fine connecting with satellite, but in the phones, why do we need to like, go to the so question is, why do you need to go to the satellite to do clock synchronization or? Uh, no? in, in the phones, like you said that the mobile towers are giving the mobile value for that. Yes. And same as the GPS like satellite is doing. So, like, okay, question. Now, if I understand your question, you are asking in a phone, since you can synchronize your clock with respect to the cell tower, why do you need to listen to a satellite? Is that the question? So maybe I should explain this again. So I was not saying that if you want to synchronize a phone's clock, you are going to turn on the GPS chip and try to synchronize with a satellite. All I was saying is if you are using GPS to find your location, you have to do clock synchronization with it. Okay, So that's only for doing mapping. You are not going to use clock synchronization at other times. Other times your phone will still synchronize with that cell tower. Okay, All right. So now there are many other positioning technologies which I will not talk about, but your phone actually has the capability of localizing itself with regards with respect to cell towers as well, because cell towers are also at a known location. And they are also land. So anything that's at a known location is called a landmark. Landmark is something with a known location and known coordinate. Okay, if the site if cell towers are also broadcasting time, okay, and if you are within this uh, distance of multiple cell towers, you can triangulate yourself. This process is called triangulation. You're trying to find your distance to multiple known landmarks and trying to figure where you are with respect to multiple landmarks and trying to find your location. Okay? So you can do triangulation with respect to cell tower and also find your location. Okay? Same thing. You basically, you'll do exactly what you did in GPS. You'll listen for broadcast. You'll assume that there is some drift on your clock. The locations or cell towers are known, so you can figure this out. Okay. Now, there are now other technologies that also do the same thing. There's something called indoor positioning technology, IPS. They are using things like Wi Fi access points and they're trying to triangulate with respect to an access point. Okay. So now, if you use that technology, you have to make sure that the access points are at known locations. Okay. And then you are any machine with a Wi Fi chip can actually figure out its location with respect to multiple access points that it can listen to. Okay, Same technique. Okay? The latest versions of Wi-Fi, which is Wi-Fi 6 something, not 6E, but 6, some other letter after 6, actually has IPS built in. Okay? The reason is inside buildings, you can't actually do GPS because you can't see satellites from indoors. So GPS doesn't work indoors. It will work well outdoors, but as soon as you come inside, GPS is not going to work. So if you now want to figure out where you are inside some building or some large mall or an airport, you essentially need indoor positioning. They use the same technique. All of them will essentially have exactly this idea. Okay. Any questions? So that's GPS. There are lots of other wireless synchronization protocol that basically do the same thing. They will have a beacon, uh, sorry, a landmark that's going to send out beacons. You listen for beacons, which are time broadcast, and then you try to figure out your distance to a landmark. You have multiple landmarks, so you do triangulation. Okay, and you have to always do clock sync as part of that to get good distance. All right. Okay. So I won't talk about this, but this is the same thing. But I will talk about instead the next 10 or so minutes is this notion of a logical clock. Okay. So now, so far, what we have done is we figured out how to synchronize physical clocks or machines with respect to some authoritative source, which is a time server. It could be a satellite, something that is synchronized with a atomic clock, unless you are doing the Berkeley algorithm, in which case it's all relative, not absolute. Okay. So we'll assume that most machines 
are going to use clock synchronization, specifically NTP like protocols to synchronize themselves. Okay. Now, any clock synchronization algorithm, no matter how good you make it, will still have some error built in. Okay. And that error simply comes from estimating the proper network propagation delays. Okay. You can make any number of measurements, but there will still be some error. The error will never go to zero. There will be some finite error epsilon. Okay. So what that means is all clock synchronization techniques okay, will have some error tolerance in it, which means you can never perfectly synchronize your clock with respect to another clock because the propagation delay is somewhat variable. Okay. So every clock synchronization technique, no matter how good it is, has a built-in tolerance. So now let's assume that you are using your timestamps uh, on your machine to do some reasoning of orders. As you say, okay, file changed at this time, something else happened there, should I build my file or, or maybe the message left at this time, it was processed here, what's the total time it took for the message to propagate. You can use timestamps for all kinds of things. You are using timestamps to do measurements of latency on your for your lab, right? So all of that, because the clocks are not going to be perfectly synchronized, will have some error built into it. Okay? So you can always ask if there are two events with timestamps that are very close to one another, okay? and the difference between those two timestamps is within the to error tolerance of your clock synchronization protocol, then you cannot actually tell which event has happened before which other event just by looking at the timestamp. Okay. In particular, if you look at NTP, if you go back a few slides, I said NTP has the built-in error of 50 milliseconds. That means no matter how frequently you run the NTP protocol, your clock might be as much as 50 milliseconds off with respect to an NTP server. Okay. This is a built-in 50 millisecond is the error tolerance. So if you have two, time, two events that occur within 50 milliseconds of one another, and you say, okay, can you look at the timestamp and say which order they happened? You can just look at the timestamp and say this happened after that because that has a greater timestamp, but that may not be actually true because of NTP error tolerances. Okay? So you don't know in this case. Okay? So and you can say, I'll have a better version of NTP. It may now go bring it down to one millisecond, but I have the same problem. If two events occurred within one millisecond of each other, and I look at their clock values, timestamp values, I still can't tell in what order they are. Right? So, so you can never make this go to zero. There's going to be always some uncertainty when events are occurring very close to one another. Okay? So how do we get around this? Okay? So we will use a different technique to figure this out. We will use something called a logical clock. Okay? So logical clock essentially is a technique that allows us to figure out the order of events but not the exact time of events. Okay? If the only thing you care about is to reason about in what order some events occurred, but you don't actually need the actual time, then this is a good approach. If you need to know absolute time at which some event occurred, saying that this happened before noon, did you submit your lab before noon? Because that's when, or midnight, because that's when the lab is, that's absolute time. Okay? But if I just want to ask, did this group submit before this other group? I don't need the actual time. I just need to know the order, right? So that's the different problem. So in many cases, you want to reason about ordering, but not necessarily the time, which means you just want to compare two events and figure out which one happened before which other. You don't need to know whether there was how much time elapsed between them. That's a different problem. So for this group of problems where you only care about ordering, you can actually do better than real, use real clock synchronization. We'll use a concept called a logical clock which is going to look like a physical clock, but it's not really a clock at all. Okay? So essential idea is that for many problems in distributed systems, the absolute time at which events occurred is not important. It's only the relative order of events. And if that is all you want to reason about, we'll look at some other ways to do it. Okay? So in this case, we will not use clock synchronization at all. Okay? We won't even use real clocks. Okay, we'll use something else to figure out about order of events. Okay. So all we want is to agree on the order. And here is essentially how we are going to do it. We are going to define a property called event ordering, 
which allows us to define a total ordering of a set of events. What these events are, we don't care. Okay? Those could be when files changed, when messages were received, could be any type of event. Okay? We assume event is some abstract thing that we just want to reason about. Okay? So we will do the following. We'll assume that on a single machine, okay, all events are totally ordered because machine is executing some program sequentially. Okay? If some instruction was executed by a processor before some other instruction, you know that there is an ordering simply because that's how the program executed. Okay? So within a single machine, everything is totally ordered. All events that are occurring are totally ordered. Maybe you have a print statement and you call some function because that's the order in which you executed those, that code. We know the event order. Now, we want to now not only reason about order in which events are occurring on one machine, we want to take things in a distributed system and say, here's this event and that's that event. Which one occurred before which other event? Right? So we want to do this type of reasoning. So how are we going to do this? Okay. So here we'll assume there is no global clock. Global clock essentially means a perfectly synchronized clock. Okay. That's what we mean by global clock. That means that there is one clock that's perfectly synchronized uh, on all machines, all machines have, uh, have the exact time. So you can then you, you know, use timestamp to reason. But we'll assume that doesn't exist because we just argued that no clock synchronization is perfect. Okay. So there is no way to have all clocks be perfectly synchronized. So it's a no perfect synchronization. Clocks can be arbitrarily unsynchronized. We will not care at all because we will not run clock synchronization. Yet we want to understand how events are occurring on machines. Okay. So what's the basic idea? Okay. So we'll use a very simple property. Okay. And the property we'll use is, we'll use message passing behavior across applications to try to reason about events. Okay. And the very basic property we are going to use, it almost sounds obvious once you think about it, is messages must be sent before they are received. Okay. If you have a message that goes from one machine to the other, okay, no matter what, Clocks, you have it has to be the case that the send event has occurred before the receive. A message can't be received before it was even sent. Okay, so that's all we are going to use to reason about events. Okay, so I'm going to show you a picture, then we'll stop here and continue next time. Okay, so maybe we make a new thing here. Okay, so here is a machine. Some events are occurring on this machine. Since, since a single machine, these events are already ordered because that's the order in which that process executed. Okay, so this is our machine A. Okay, there's another machine B. Okay, some other events occur on this machine. Okay, and on this machine, that's the order of events. Okay, now if I just ask you, here's an event. And here's another event. Okay. If I compare these two events, what order did they occur? Okay. Since we don't have clock synchronization, okay, we can't say. If, if you had clock synchronization, you would say, okay, what is the time at which that event occurred? What is the time at which this event occurred? I take those two timestamps, I compare them. And so which one is greater? That have occurred later. But we assume now there's no clock synchronization. Clocks can be arbitrarily out of sync. Okay? So what order did they occur? Okay, at this point, we have no information to say anything. Okay? But let's assume now that there is a message that A has sent to B. Okay? Maybe A made a RPC call to B. Okay? That's that message that went from A to B. Okay. So now with this extra information, if I say compare these two events, can you say something? Okay. So we'll use very simple ideas. So we'll say, okay, what do we know about this message? Okay, laws of physics must hold. Okay. The send has to happen before receive. Okay, because messages can only propagate at speed of light. Okay. The send is before the receive. So now we have an ordering of two events on two different machines, even though we don't know anything about the clock value. So in particular, this event, which is the send, and this event, which is the receive, we know an ordering between them. Send is always going to happen before the receive, because that's the message. Okay? Now, if I look at machine A, I know that that event there has occurred before the send, because that's the execution order of those events. Okay? 
Okay, because that whatever that in function is was executed before the send function. So you know that on that machine, those two events are ordered. Okay? On the on machine B, we know that the receive has executed before that other event because that's execution order. Okay. Transitive property also is going to hold. Okay, because you have local execution, you have send and receive. So we say, okay, that event has occurred before the send, send has occurred before the receive, the receive has occurred before this one. So by law of transitivity, we are going to say that that even now these two events are all that in particular, that event has occurred before this event. Okay. If there was no message that was exchanged between these two machines, we can't tell. We say that these are unordered events. We can't, we don't have any information to order them. But as soon as you send a message okay, from one machine to the other, all events that occur before the send and all events that occur after the receive are automatically ordered. Okay. Now, there are other events here before the receive, there are other events after the send. Those still don't have any order. We have a partial order at this point. That order basically is following this timeline. Right? All events on that timeline have gotten order. But there are other events that will happen after and before that we still don't know anything. But as more messages get exchanged, more and more events are going to get ordered across machines. Okay? And that's all we will use for event ordering. We'll essentially use this property which says send has to occur before receive. Local execution is sequential. So we are going to use transitive property to order even as soon as messages get exchanged between processes. Yes, question. So, Okay, question is, do servers and data center use logical clocks or absolute? In most real world application, they're still based on timestamps, NTP, real clocks, okay? This is a good idea. It's used in some techniques, but by and large, you just use physical clocks and you timestamp. And there's always a risk that when there are two very closely spaced events, if they're within the error tolerance of the clock synchronization algorithm, you may get something wrong. Because reasoning does not work in that case. In this case, that problem is not going to occur because you are just using message passing properties to order even. Okay. Now we still haven't, this is a basic idea. We haven't de de designed a clock synchronization algorithm using this idea that we'll do next time. Okay. But at least you understand how without any clock, just by looking at some pictures, you can now tell how events are actually occurring in a distributed system. Okay, one last question. Uh, Question is, if you knew something about the drift on machine A and B, can you then use that drift to reason about events that occur after the send and compare them with something, right? So the short answer is you are not going to do that because you are not using clocks at all. As we'll see next time, we are not going to use physical clocks at all. So the question of using drift will not arise in this technique. If you want to use drift and other techniques, you are back to using standard time stamping and clock synchronization. Okay, that's what you will do. You will just time stamp these events, assume clocks are synchronized and then compare them. If the time values are more than the maximum drift rate, you actually have a good order. They're within, then you don't know. But here we won't use that. We are going to use other techniques, which we will have to wait till next time to see. Okay? But, but at the end of the day, you'll only get a partial order. That's the short answer. You'll never get a total order. What I mean to ask is that, uh... Like suppose we are not synchronizing with any atomic clock or a time server. Uh, we just have the two times of the two machines. We never synchronize this. Uh, we, can we determine an ordering if we just pass one message between them or all the events happening? No. So if you just have one message that go between two machines, all you have done is you ordered events on that timeline, but not anything else. That's all we can do based on transitive problem. So anything that specifically all events before the receive. And after the send cannot be ordered by this message, but maybe there are other messages. A message may go back in the reverse direction. More things will get ordered. Right? But at this point, with one message, that's all you will do. Okay? But we are assuming there will be a lot more messages. So more things will get ordered. But we'll get back to that next time. Okay, so let's stop here.